Good morning. Uh, like Jim said, my name is Matt Klosterman. And I am an independent developer, and I'm based out of the Dallas area. Uh, myself and a few of my friends, we work together on developing iPhone and iPad apps for companies, as well as some of our own products. And I'm going to start today with a short story. And oddly enough, it involves weather, just like our last presentation. So that is kind of cool. Um, so I have two kids. Jack and Madison, and we have a third due to join us in May. And this is my daughter, Madison. And by the way, she is absolutely thrilled that I'm in Madison, Wisconsin right now. <laughs> She'll be 10 years old later this year. And when she was born in 2004, I also had the privilege to be working on a project that I thought was extremely exciting. And at the time, I was working for a company called Weather Data. And that company would eventually become part of AccuWeather. And this company had a focus on developing really new and exciting ways of delivering real-time weather information. And so what was this particular project I worked on? Well, it had two components. The first was this Windows mobile application you see here. And it ran on devices that had GPS and cellular data connections. Now, think about that. This was 2004. There weren't any iPhones. There were iPads. Remember these things? Um, this was state-of-the-art at the time. And yes, that is a PC MCIA GPS device hanging off the back of that thing. Um, and our users, they thought they were doing good when they got a, a connection on an edge network. And so the other part of the solution was there was an application that ran on computers that sat at television stations and could be displayed on air. And that was the part of the system that I worked on. And it looked something like this. And when you put the two together, the TV stations got something really cool that they could do. And so they could, sh say there was a severe weather event, like a tornado, a windstorm, snowstorm, or ice storm. They could send their reporters and storm chasers out to cover the event. And they could take a weather display like this showing the storm, and they could overlay the precise locations of each of their reporters right there on the map. So they could have a reporter on the phone saying, I see a tornado and it's right over there, well, normally a viewer hears that and they're like, what does that mean? It's like some two random two roads intersecting in a field somewhere. And it doesn't mean anything to a user or to a viewer. Well, this allowed the TV station to show exactly where that reporter was so that the viewer knew what the, they were saying on the phone actually meant. And in second, the other reporters and storm chasers that were out there if they weren't on the phone, they could still be sending in text-based reports saying they saw a tornado, they saw winds, they saw hail, they saw snow six inches deep, that type of thing. And it would display on the television weather display as well. So a storm chaser could be at a location. They could say, I, I see a tornado on the ground, and it's two, three miles northeast of me. They could hit send, and it would send up. It would go to the television weather display. And the viewer would see this and they would see the location of that reporter, they would see the location of where the tornado is at that point in time, and they would see the storm right there as well. And finally, what was really cool, and was really pushing the limits of what was practical back then, and this is a really bad screenshot, because I wasn't, didn't have the foresight to capture all this stuff 10 years ago. Sorry. Um, what was really cool is that they could also send in pictures and small videos from their mobile devices. And it would go up and it would show on the weather display, and the meteorologist could tap on one of the weather reports, like that one saying River out of Banks. You could tap on it, and it would show the picture that the reporter took of that uh, thing happening. And so the result was this system, and it was, ad was adopted by some of the largest local television stations in the country very quickly. Well, how did that happen? Like, this was 10 years ago. It was a small company. There was only a few of us developers. How did that company build something that leapfrogged technologically what all the other entrenched players in the TV weather business were doing at the time? And it was possible for them because the barrier to entry for technology to both locate a device and to connect that device to a network anywhere else on Earth had reached a sweet spot, both economically and technologically. Developers could experiment with the technology with only spending a little bit of money. And the system level APIs to interact with, those, with that technology was getting mature enough that they could focus on just building the user-facing product. And so 
even though I didn't work on the mobile side of that project, it's what really opened my eyes to how exciting mobile was going to become. And now, 10 years later, I'm the most excited about a change in technology since I have been since I worked on that project. And I'm excited because it's becoming clear we're in the early days of the next big shift in consumer software and hardware technology. Now, a common refrain coming from every direction is that wearables are that next big frontier. And undeniably, there are a lot of products out there now that are really neat, like the Pebble, Samsung Galaxy Gear, or Google Glass. But that's not exactly what I'm excited about. Expanding outward beyond wearables, there's a lot of attention being paid to sensor devices in general. Things like Fitbits, fuel bands, and even car diagnostic sensors like the automatic. But that's not what I'm excited about either. What I'm excited about is there's an even bigger theme, and that's that software and hardware to connect computers and mobile devices to real world objects is becoming commoditized. It's becoming commoditized in the same way that GPS and cellular technology was 10 years ago. So let's visualize this another way. Here are just a few handful of items that we see out in the real world every day. Things like barcode scanners, restaurant buzzers, buzzers etc. Really, anything that it hooks up to a traditional computer and interacts with people. I don't really think it's too far of a stretch to think of devices like this and think how in a few more years, what's going to happen, and it's already starting to happen, is we're going to think about it this way. You may have seen this recently. This was an image or of an ad from Radio Shack from 1991. And the person who posted this posted it because the point was there's all these things that were really desirable to, in this advertisement in 1991, and they're all now possible with this device you carry with you that costs less than $600, your phone. And so, just like in consumer-facing technologies, like the cameras and radios, all these other technologies that are out there today that required specialized engineering or knowledge are now becoming possible and accessible for developers like me and you to be able to build upon and innovate. And just like the weather company I worked for 10 years ago today, we have the ability to take advantage of these barriers to entry disappearing and build what's going to be the next big thing and what's going to be exciting for our users and help them understand their surroundings better and react to their surroundings better. Put another way, someone else is already out there building these highways and they're opening up and you and I can focus on just building the cars that run on them and do neat things. And there are many ways to connect to apps to the real world now. Things like those sensors we're talking about to talk over Bluetooth low energy or things like the camera in your phone to connect as a barcode scanner. A couple other things that Apple has introduced recently in iOS 6 and 7 are Passbook and iBeacons. They introduced Passbook in iOS 6, and they introduced iBeacons in iOS 7. And these are the two I'm going to talk about today, and I'm going to talk about why they matter even if you aren't an iOS developer. So first, Passbook launched in 2012, and it had a lot of fanfare from Apple, and some very large companies started adopting it. And I happened to be working on a team that worked on the American Airlines Passbook implementation when it launched. And since then, you haven't seen a lot with Passbook. Um, and there's really a pervasive view that it's really just a tool for big companies like American Airlines or Target, Delta, Fandango, all those big companies that are out there. And if you're not a big company, you might think, why does it matter to me? I think that's unfortunate because I think that view of Passbook as a technology is wrong. And so what I want you to do is forget about that idea of Passbook. I want you to think about something else instead. I want you to think about a shoebox. And this isn't really a big stretch of the imagination because the URL scheme that Passbook used was shoebox. And so what if we think of Passbook as a shoebox? How does that help us? What I want you to think about is artifacts. So what interactions occur between you and your users, or between your users and their customers? And what happens with those interactions? Does something get left behind? Is there a messy paper trail that's going to end up in a shoebox somewhere? Or is there information communicated that either party is going to quickly forget? If there is, Passbook or the similar technologies on Android are a great tool for any app or website, large or small, to capture valuable information that otherwise would be discarded or easily forgotten in someone's busy schedule. 
So an example. So last year, I worked with an event that wanted to make their passbook passes unique. So the solution we decided on and what we implemented was that before each set of speaker came up, about five to 10 minutes before, we'd send out a push notification to update the pass. The pass would update with the, speakers, the next speaker's picture, and the uh, back of the pass would update the schedule, the list of upcoming sessions would change, and then the session that's ended would go down to the bottom to a list of completed sessions. And what this allowed was for attendees to always know at a glance what was going on and where they should be. They didn't have to launch an app, they didn't have to launch a browser, they didn't have to carry on a piece of paper. They just knew where it was because it was right there on their lock screen. Here's another example. I have the American Express Passbook Pass. And yesterday, I went to lunch down at the Bassett Street Bunch Club next to Doubletree. And I handed a waitress my card, and almost the very instant she swiped it, I had a push notification for my Passbook Pass. When I opened the pass, it told me the amount of the transaction and who the merchant was. This everyday transaction that I had had now had value added to it. I had more information and validation about um, this transaction than I had access to immediately in the past. And of the two technologies we're, I'm discussing, Passbook and iBeacons, the cross-platform issue is the trickiest um, with Passbook. It's an Apple technology, and it's probably about as likely to have an iWatch under here as that Apple is going to promote Passbook on any other platform. It doesn't stop some other Android developers from creating Passbook clones that read Passbook files. These Passbook files are just basically a JSON file, some images, they're signed and they're put into a zip file. So that's an option. It's debatable if that works really well. Other options are things like Google and Samsung Wallet. And all three, Google Wallet, Samsung Wallet, and Passbook Wallet, they have some subtle differences and as well as some substantial differences. But what they have in common is what I want you to focus on, and that is, they're all trying to take a step towards bridging that gap between these conventional interactions that are ingrained in our cultures and trying to turn them into something that's more efficient and generate more long-term value for both parties. Okay, so what if people actually start adopting Passbook in mass? What's, what happens then? The problem is that the user's digital wallet is gonna start to look like a messy shoebox, like my Passbook. Um, and so that's a big problem, and Apple will notice that's a problem as well. And one of the technologies in iOS 7 helps with that. And that technology is iBeacons. So what's an iBeacon? Well, at a high level, that's an iBeacon. It's a little small device called an Estimo. It's waterproof, runs on battery. They make it in different colors to fit into different surroundings. That's an iBeacon. It's about the size of a quarter, runs on a watch battery for a few months up to a year. That's an iBeacon. Um, it's called the Blue Station. It plugs into a USB port on any computer or any USB charger. That's an iBeacon. Um, the automatic car sensor has been updated to act as an iBeacon now. And also, any recent iOS device or any recent Android device can be made through software to act like an iBeacon as well. But what does an iBeacon actually do? First thing, they're a Bluetooth low energy device. And if you don't know what Bluetooth low energy is, a high level overview is that it's part of the Bluetooth 4.0 specification. And the devices are free to communicate without having been previously paired. And like it says on the tin, it uses less energy than previous implementations of Bluetooth. And part of that specification is an advertising packet. Like a Wi-Fi broadcast signal, these, device, these Bluetooth Low Energy devices send out these advertising packets and they say, hey, look at me, I'm over here, this is what I am. And with iBeacons, what Apple decided to do is that the advertising packet has a little bit of data um, allowed for manufacturing specific data. And what they decided to do was to encode three different identifiers inside that advertising data. So that basically, if someone is hearing that beacon talk, the beacon can say kind of who it is and what it's for at the same time. And those identifiers, um, first is a unique, unique identifier, 16 bytes, a UUID, universally unique identifier. There's a major number that's two bytes and a minor number that's two bytes. 
the unique identifier, or UUID, you want to think of that as kind of per, one, using one per company or per use case. And the reason why is that on iOS, you can only tell an app or a pass to monitor 10 different identifiers at a time. Beyond that, you have a major number. It's two bytes and gives you approximately 65,000 uh, unique ways to di differentiate a beacon with that major number. Minor number, same thing. Two bytes, 65,000 more ways to, unique, to uniquely identify a beacon. You combine them together, and you get roughly 4 billion unique ways to differ differentiate an iBeacon underneath um, one company's usage or one broad use case. So, it's a lot of numbers, so let's make it into a simple example. So there's a chain department store. They could generate a UUID to use for all of their applications or just for, their, for this one application. They could say, for each store, I'm going to make the major number be the store number, store number 1496. They could say, the minor number is just going to represent which department that, is in, that beacon is in. And they could go and sprinkle those throughout the uh, store. Now, if a coffee chain would do the same thing, what it would allow them to do is have their pass that was um, previously only going to show up on my lock screen if I walked into my 10 favorite locations. It would now show up on my lock screen if I walked into any of their locations where they had put a beacon. Same thing with the department store. They could customize their app, and it could show electronic stuff when you're in the electronics department, home stuff when you're in the home department, stuff like that. And like I just said, the possibilities go way beyond passes. Consider this. This is a version of the American Airlines app prior to the iOS 7 redesign. And this was um, basically the way it looked since the app launched. The information layout hadn't changed. And last year, we worked on redesigning this for iOS 7. And this is what it looks like after um, the iOS 7 redesign. And the biggest thing that changed is that the home screen got turned into a flow of information that could change contextually. So if you are getting closer to your flight, the information about your flight will, e will either appear in more detail or uh, it, it will show you if you're checked in, you have your boarding pass, stuff like that. Same thing if it checks your location. If you're getting near your flight but you're not at the airport, it's going to show you driving directions uh, and traffic times, so you know what time you need to leave to get to the airport. But a problem is that the location that you get out of something like, say, DFW Airport, where I flew out of Thursday, an app has a hard, hard time knowing if you're even at the airport when you're at a location that's that big, let alone like what you intend to be doing at the airport at that point in time. And that's a problem that iBeacons are really good at helping you solve. It gives your app a clue. It gives your app a clue about where your user is at and what they might care about at that point in time. And a really great thing about iBeacons is that since they are just Bluetooth Low Energy devices, any platform that supports Bluetooth Low Energy and gives your app access to the advertising data can potentially benefit from iBeacon hardware that's being sold today. Now, Remember to common view a passbook and how reality isn't quite in line with that, in my opinion. You also probably are seeing lots of things about iBeacons in the press. Uh, there's lots of stories. And two things I keep hearing is that first, iBeacons mean instant indoor location mapping, and that second, iBeacons mean NFC is dead. So I want to talk about that, those two things real fast and whether they're true or not. First, let's talk about what iBeacon advertises again. It advertises those three identifiers, but it also has something called a, a transmission power that it uses two bytes to represent. Basically what that means is if I am going to install an iBeacon, say I'm going to put one here, and when I install that and I configure it, usually most of the iBeacons give you an iPhone app to configure it. When I do that, I'm going to hold the device a certain distance away from that iBeacon, and I'm going to measure the signal strength coming out of that. And that signal strength is now gets configured into the iBeacon and it gets sent in every broadcast that that iBeacon sends out as this transmission power value. And what this is is an RSSI value, which means it's the receive signal strength indication. And what it means as an app developer to you is that 
when you have an app and you're here uh, listening to these iBeacons and you s get a value for a new RSSI value of what it is right now, you can compare it to that one when you calibrated the device. And you get an idea of is the device that the user is holding, is it closer to the device or to the beacon or is it farther away? And you, you can get a rough idea of the distance, but there's a problem with that. Um, the problem is you, as you get farther away from that iBeacon, the accuracy of that calculation is going to go down. So iOS is using this concept for you automatically, and it's called ranging. And it does some logic around things like the RSSI value, and it classifies the distance your app is away from the iBeacon into kind of four categories. Immediate, like you're right here on top of it. Near, you're close to it, or far, that you're farther away from it. Or it also will just say unknown, it couldn't decide. Now, so I said how that accuracy declines as you get farther and farther away. Like if you try to convert this to a number of meters away I am, it's gonna get farther and farther away. And so that means that we're probably not gonna get this indoor location nirvana that everyone's talking about with iBeacons. The So the problem is, sorry, I got my slides mixed up. Um, so anyway, you're not gonna get the um, precision that you want if you're just going to put out iBeacons and try to triangulate and map people using just iBeacons. You would have to put a whole lot of iBeacons very close together to do it, and it's just not practical for most uh, use cases. Now the other part of that is NFC. And you hear a lot of people saying iBeacons means NFC is dead. And I, NFC might be dead, but it's not because iBeacons are magic and solve every single problem that's out there. And the first reason why is that iBeacons are one way, whereas NFC is a two-way communication. And the second problem is that since iBeacons just make clever use of this Bluetooth advertising data, there's nothing stopping you or me from configuring our iPhone or Android device to go and act like an iBeacon that acts like Targets or Starbucks as iBeacons and act either the same or slightly different from that. So if the problem you're trying to solve involves precisely identifying the location of both parties, iBeacons as your only solution isn't gonna get you very far. For now, I would stick to using iBeacons for clues because they're great at providing your app clues that you didn't have before. And clues about where your user's at and what it is that they wanna do. Now all, all of those clues gonna be created equal. They're not. I can think of several different ones that we can think about. One, you deploy a single beacon. You take your, you put that in your store. As soon as the user walks in with your app in the store, well, you know that you might, they might wanna do something to interact with your store because they're there. Well, another case is you deploy multiple beacons with the same purpose. So you have, um, like the department store example. You have these multiple beacons spread out in different departments and you have an idea of which department they might care about the most based on which one you're seeing the strongest signal coming from. Third, what if we had multiple beacons but with different purposes? And this is where I think it gets interesting. What if your app is aware of a beacon like a stick and find that can be put onto different objects like a sticker? What clues would that provide an app that you make? And that's where it gets interesting. As an example, consider this. Say I have a reminders application. What if I could set a reminder such as, remind me if I'm in my car, but I don't have my bag with me? Are there cases like that that you can customize your application where you can customize your app based on knowing what the user is near or knowing that they're near something, but they're not near something else? I bet there are, and I bet there are a lot of them. And I think when you start thinking of beacons like that, your view of what your app sees about the user and what they care about at any given point in time is going to change drastically. And I think it's kind of like going from an app or, where you, or a car, going back to the previous analogy, where you've built this car that has 
a navigation system. And it's like going to an app or a car where it now knows how to use that navigation system to drive itself or to drive what you, the information your user cares about right to, what, right to them right when they need it. iBeacons and Passbook are just two of these technologies that are bridging the gap between the real world and our apps today. And I think there's going to be a lot more on the way. So with that, I say, go build your cars. Thank you. So I think we've got time for two questions. Anyone? All right. Oh, sorry. Mitch. Okay, it's not really a question, but more so uh, for those of you who know what uh, coin is, not Bitcoin, the only coin, the new wallet, mobile card, that's usually basically the location with Bluetooth. That's how it knows when you're away from your wallet or you've left your device away. It's that whole same location sensing with just the single device. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, you talked a little bit about how using it in the stores and things like that. I mean, do you see that how companies are kind of adapting with the like the Google Wallet stuff with the tap to pay, do you see potential for integration with both in the same concept or is it kind of just more two separate? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I think there's a, I think that you, a lot of the integrations you're gonna see are gonna be where they integrate the two together because it, it solves a certain pain point for a lot of customers and a lot of businesses that they both have today. But I don't think that's gonna be the only I think that's the one we're going to hear about the most, kind of like how that's what we hear about with Passbook the most. But I don't think that's going to be the only one. I think really any time that you, you can provide your, your app a clue is where it's going to be valuable. And I think that's where it's up to people like you and me who ha are, aren't these big companies that are working on maybe smaller things. That's where the killer app's going to come from and where it's going to really open people's minds to what these technologies can do. And one day they're going to open their phone and it's going to tell them, the app's going to tell them exactly what they want it to do. And they're going to go, wow. And then eventually, every time they open the app, that's just going to be their expectation that it's always going to know what they want when they want it. I'm not sure if that answered your question, did it? Okay. All right, thank you. Okay.